Welcome to the Ultimate Life Television Program, brought to you by Pastor Gracia Selassie Awie of Treasure House ICGC, where you are treasured and not trashed. My subject today is seven needful questions to unlock your destiny. Seven needful questions to your breakthrough. Most of you would have heard of their brothers John and Charles Wesley. They were brothers who were mightily used by God. They were Christian legends. They stood out on 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 uh, or they, they stood out on um, a rising of Christian history. They lived around seven, 1703 to 1791. John Wesley was the founder of what was called the Holy Club at Oxford University. He's also the founder of the Methodist Church. Him and his brother, Charles, wrote many great hymns, and the church is still singing them today. The Holy Club at Oxford was an interesting club in that it was formed so that people could get closer to God. And what they did was, <laughs> they used to have devotionals and various means that people could read in order to get closer to God. One of those was something called the 22 questions. And the 22 questions were designed to be read every day to see where you were at. You would ask yourself questions. In that way, you would evaluate your life. We don't have time to read them all today, but I want to look at a few. You would ask yourself a question like, am I consciously or unconsciously creating the impression that I'm better than I really am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? Next question. Am I honest in all my acts and words? Or do I exaggerate? Next question. Do I confidently uh, pass on to others what has been said to me in confidence? I'll, I'll say that again. Do I confidentially, do I confidentially pass on to others what has been said to me in confidence? Next one, can I be trusted? Number five, am I a slave to dress, to friends, to work or habits? Number six, am I self-conscious, self-pitying or self-justifying? Seven, did the Bible live in me today? Eight, do I give the Bible time to speak to me every day? Nine, am I enjoying prayer? Ten, when did I last speak to someone or someone else of my faith? When did I last speak to someone else of my faith? Number 11, do I pray about the money I spend? 12, do I get to bed on time and get up on time? 13, do I disobey God in anything? 14, do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience, or conscience, forgive me, do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? Am I defeated in any part of my life? Am I jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, or distrustful? 17. How do I spend my spare time? 18. Am I proud? 19. Do I thank God that I'm not as other people, especially as the Pharisees who despise the publican? 20. Is there anyone whom I fear, dislike, disown, criticize, hold uh, a resentment toward or disregard? If so, what am I doing about it? 21. Do I grumble or complain constantly? 22. Is Christ real to me? 
John felt that asking questions was one of the best ways we could get to evaluate our lives. Francis Bacon, the English philosopher, said, Who questions much shall learn much and retain much. Who questions much shall learn much and retain much. Anthony Robbins, the motivational speaker, said, successful, successful people, forgive me, successful people ask better questions and as a result, they get better answers. Socrates, who lived around 400 BC, will not just give his people's information. He will ask them questions and in that way, he will get them to think and as they thought about the questions, they came up with solutions. And he said it was the best way to learn. How many of you know that questions are very good? When someone asks you a question, it makes you think. What are you doing about the needy? It makes you think and then stares you to action. God asks lots of questions in the Bible, lots of them in fact. And when he asks questions, it's not because he doesn't know. God knows everything. He's omniscient. But when he asks us a question, he asks us to get us to think and then we get to, uh, and to get us to act. He gets us to act. I believe that questions are very powerful. And when you respond to questions, it can open the door to breakthroughs. It can actually unlock your destiny. So I want us to look at seven of them today. And they are going to open doors to your breakthrough. They are going to unlock your destiny. Your life is not going to be the same. They are designed to get us to think, not only to think, but to act. How many of you believe in breakthroughs today? Do you believe that God can do supernatural things in your life? You need to be especially careful when you face disappointment or discouragement or failure because that is the time you can exclude the supernatural. A lot is going on in our world today and you still need to believe that God is able. He's a God of the supernatural. He's a God of miracles. You need to be open to the supernatural. All through our world is trouble and we face trouble. Miracles are still possible, you know. So let's look at the first question that I want us to talk about today. Number one, what do you want? What do you want? God is asking you today, what do you want? What is it that you want and desire? Because when you think about what you want, then you can begin to take action to achieve it. Without a really strong want in your life, nothing will happen. I will say that again. Without a really strong want, a desire in your life, nothing will happen. How many of you realize that things don't just come into your life? They come into your life when you really want them. How bad do you want it? And God is asking you today, what is it you want? What do you want for your personal life? Where you fellowship, where you go to church, what do you want for that ministry? When you really want, you will act and do something about it. Jesus came into Jericho in Luke's gospel. He came across a man. This guy was blind. And the man was calling out to him. Wanting him to help him. Come with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, and I'm reading from verse 40 to 43. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you, Lord? 
Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Jesus was trying to assess the desire level. Where is your desire level today? Once he, as he established that, he really wanted to do something about it. Once he establishes what he really wanted, he then was able to act and heal him. How many of you realize God can do anything he likes? Anything. Whenever he likes. And he can do it without your permission. Without your participation. But he always chooses to ask you a question and then to work through you. There is God's sovereignty and human responsibility. There is God's part and there is your part. Jesus will even say to people, if you can believe, it's not only up to God, if you can believe, God needs human beings to do his work on the earth. And so he asks questions. He then sees where we are and then he works through us. In John chapter 5, Jesus comes across a man who had been sick for 38 good years. That's a very, very long time. So let's look at it. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called, is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five uh, covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else uh, goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up pick up your mat and uh, walk there are obstacles in life that all of us can list i'm telling you we can all write things down put things down think things you know and come up with excuses why things are not happening but how 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 much do you really want something will drive you through that obstacle. If you want it bad, nothing will stop you. He assessed that and that all that there was a deep desire and a want. And that was enough to get the man to do something. Notice, what do you want? And God is asking you the same question. What do you want? Now do it. And when there is a strong enough want and we realize what we really want, then when you take action, trust me, miracles will happen. So, number one, what do you want? Note that down. Put it down somewhere. What do you want? What do you want from life? What do you want God to do for you? Question number two, what do you see? You need to want things in life. But you've also got to see them clearly. And God speaks to Jeremiah here and asks him a question. And I want you to notice there's a twofold thing here that he sees in this passage. There are two dimensions that he sees as God gives him a vision. 
So, let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 11 to 14. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see? Jeremiah. So, you could put your name there. Maybe you are Stella or James or uh, Michael, whatever your name is. The Lord is asking you, what do you see? What do you see? And so, what do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree. I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly. If he saw wrongly, God would have said it. He said, you've seen correctly. For I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling. I answered, it is tilting toward us from the, from the north. It is tilting toward us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. Do you know what God is asking us to do today? He's asking you to look around us in our world and see what's going on. See what God is doing. When most of us look at the world, do you know what we see? Negativity. Yes ago, it used to be terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. Now that has been replaced by something else. You, some time ago, they were, you know, all over the world, wherever you went, they were talking about uh, Panama Papers and it was, uh, 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 I've forgotten the name, I think it was um, Cambridge Analytica. Refugee crisis. Migrant crisis. Now there's trouble in Europe. There's trouble in Europe. We all know about that. Russia, Ukraine. We have gas shortages. Energy crisis. We even have food crisis. You go to the shops, things are expensive. Prices have changed. The, pr the price of petrol keeps going up and down. There's famine. There's fear. People are choosing between heat or eat. And winter is approaching. But God was asking him not just to look at the negative, but he was asking him first to look at the almond tree. Something that will grow. Something that will speak of opportunity. Then there would also be disaster. Do you just see disaster? Do you just see negativity? Or do you see opportunity? As well because God wants you to look around your world and not just see the negative see opportunity then when you see the opportunity coupled with the negativity you still act to see things come to pass most of us see the negatives and we get put off Be careful you don't feed yourself too much on information from the media. What you read, what you hear, what you see, it gets into you. It influences you. It can even kill your faith. We need to see the possibility of challenges, but also opportunity. And the fact that there can be growth. I'm telling you, God can turn things around he's done it before and you do it again read the bible in the time of famine in the time of adversity god provided god took care of his own david said i've been young and now i'm old i've never seen the seed of the righteous forsaken nor beg for bread the young lions do suffer hunger but they that seek the lord will not lack any good thing the lord is our shepherd we shall not want and god can cause things to bad what is it you see today do you just see negativity in your life that there are no opportunities or do you see there are problems in the world but i can still make my way and god will make 
a way for me. He will. Trust me. What do you want? What do you see will determine what you get? Your desire and your vision. So what do you want? What do you see? Question number three. What's in your house? I'm sure you are wondering, where am I going with this? What's in your house? Your house speaks of your life. Not the house you live in. When God asks, asks what's in your house, he doesn't mean, <laughs> what type of microwave do you have? What, what type of bed do you sleep on? No, 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 that's what I'm talking about. What color is your fridge? That's not what we are talking about here. How large is your oven? What's in the house called your life? Problems? Negativity? Unbelief? Doubt? Cynicism? We read a story where a woman is emotionally empty or we read a story where a woman is emotionally empty and financially empty it's in the bible but she, and it was in the midst of famine this is relevant what she had what she had a solution in her house she had something and God asks a question of her to the prophet, Elijah. So, come with me. Let's go to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 4, verse 1. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. This woman was emotionally empty. Before we, we even get to look at her bank account, that, that woman was spent. Maybe that is how you feel today listening to me. As a Christian, as a Christ follower, you can still serve the Lord fear the Lord, revere the Lord, and end up in hardship. This woman's husband was a man of God, anointed, feared God, served God with all her heart, yet they were broke, they were poor. There's no guarantee that because you serve Jesus, everything is going to go well. This woman ended up emotionally depleted, financially depleted, and her husband was fully committed and fully devoted to God. And, and, and we have this false theology that, that sometimes teaches that if you are a Christian and you make the right confession and you, 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 you speak the right tongues and you quote scripture, it's going to work out right. That's not true. We see it here. It's there. But into this, God still brings a miracle. And he still brings a solution. Let's continue reading. Verse 2. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? Have you noticed that all the questions that uh, are being asked today is found in the Bible? I'm not making it up. How can, I, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all. Listen to, what, listen to her reply. Your servant has nothing there at all. She said, except a small jar of oil. No matter how little you've got there's something in your house i'm prophesying to you there's something in there don't let your difficulties and your challenges and, and all that you have gone to make you feel you don't have anything no there's something in there 
There's never nothing at all. If you look into the house of your life and, and you feel you don't have any gift, you don't have any talent, any opportunity, that's not right. The problem we have in our society today is uh, people are looking to the government to help them from outside. That's not how God works. God says, no, don't look to the outside. God says, don't look to, 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 to people. Look inside your house. We are waiting for what people can do for us. What have you got? Oh, I've got nothing. I'm poor. I've been deprived. No. No. No one has got nothing at all. God doesn't work that way. God is not partial. You've got something in there. And, and if you recognize it and, and use it, you'll be amazed the breakthrough that can take place in your life. Your destiny will be unlocked. Let's continue reading. Verse 3 and 4. Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for, for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. To shut means keep voices out. Keep voices out. Because most of us are listening to too many voices. And that will mess you up. This opportunity to thank you for tuning to this program and i trust that this broadcast has been a blessing to you thank you for watching the ultimate life television program we hope you have been blessed by the teaching tune in to our next program on the same channel and the same time next week may god richly bless you